Austria, 1932. Engelbert Dolfas of the Christian Social Party is designated Chancellor of Austria. He creates a new radical political movement called the Fatherland Front in the image of Italian fascism. The Fatherland Front seek to protect Austria's Catholic traditions from Protestant-dominated Germany. While in power, the Fatherland Front establishes an authoritarian and corporatist regime, the federal state of Austria. The Front banned and persecuted all of its political opponents, including communists, social democrats, but also the Austrian Nazis who want Austria to join Germany. Civil war flares up suddenly in Austria. The government, deciding to suppress the socialists, countered a general strike by martial law. These pictures, rushed to Britain from Vienna, show vividly the state of desperate crisis through which Austria has been passing. The strongholds in which the Schutzbund, or Socialist Defense League, hold out are huge blocks of flats built for the Viennese workers by the Socialist Council of the city. Here, the Socialists and Communists, suspicious of the dictatorship of Dr. Dolphus, have secreted guns and ammunition for the coup d'etat which they feared. Leftists who opposed Dolphus were accused of opposing individual liberty as Dolphus was eradicating democratic institutions, freedom of the press, and dismantling the constitutional courts. Serving as chief economic advisor to Dolphus was a man in favor of radical capitalist policies named Ludwig von Mises, who helped shape Austrian economic policy. In his early life, Mises attended the University of Vienna, where he was highly influenced by Karl Menger who later founded the Austrian School of Economics, a pro-capitalist think tank which rejects the scientific method in determining its economic theories. In his 1927 book, Liberalism, Ludwig von Mises wrote positively about Benito Mussolini and Italian fascism. It cannot be denied that fascism and similar movements aiming at the establishment of dictatorships are full of the best intentions and that their intervention has, for the moment, saved European civilization. The merit that fascism has thereby won for itself will live on eternally in history. Although sympathetic to fascism, Mises was of Jewish descent and would face persecution from the Nazis. In 1940, Mises and his wife emigrated to New York City. He came to the United States under grant by the Rockefeller Foundation, which wanted to help Mises spread his free market philosophy. Mises influenced generations of free market activists, including Murray Rothbard, Lou Rockwell, and Ron Paul, who together have shaped modern American libertarianism. In tackling the economic crisis, the Dolphus dictatorship with the Council of Ludwig von Mises pursued harsh deflationary policies designed to balance the budget and stabilize the currency. The government's program featured severe spending cuts, frozen wages, and high interest rates. When in 1937 and 38 there was a modest recovery to the global depression, unemployment never dropped below 20%. This had a devastating effect on the legitimacy of the Austrian system. The economic failures of the 1930s should be seen as a substantial reason why the Austrian society was receptive to the annexation by Germany in March 1938. The majority of Austrians welcomed the Germans into their country. Now united with Germany, they were a power once again. While Ludwig von Mises was serving under corporatist dictator Engelbert Dolfas, the pendulum was swinging the opposite direction in the United States. 
The American people were untrustworthy of conservatives after the Great Depression was initiated under Republican Herbert Hoover. Hoover sought to avoid direct federal intervention to remedy the Depression, believing that the best way to bolster the economy was through the strengthening of businesses such as banks and railroads. Hoover also refused to implement a welfare state to take care of those living in poverty due to no fault of their own. The American people were ready to embrace a social democrat who promised to challenge corporate greed. We have to struggle with the old enemies of peace, business and financial monopoly, speculation, reckless banking, class antagonism, sectionalism, war profiteering. They had begun to consider the government of the United States as a mere appendage to their own affairs. And we know now that government by organized money is just as dangerous as government by organized mob. Roosevelt gets sweeping bank regulations, social welfare programs, and infrastructure projects passed. The president quickly becomes regarded as a traitor to his class. A new organization emerges called the American Liberty League. The Liberty League in its founding document describes itself as a nonpartisan organization founded to defend the Constitution and defend the rights and liberties guaranteed by that Constitution. General Smedley Butler, a distinguished war veteran, is approached by the Liberty League. They try to convince Butler to lead a private army of 500,000 veterans to overthrow FDR, using Hitler's stormtroopers and Mussolini's black shirts as a model for success. Members of the Liberty League included representatives of America's top corporations, including J.P. Morgan, DuPont, and Goodyear Tire. President Bush, grandfather of George W. Bush, was also involved with the Liberty League. Their objective, as outlined to Butler, was to install a pro-business dictator who would reinstate the gold standard and repeal the New Deal. This fascist plot comes to the knowledge of New York Democrat Samuel Dickstein, who successfully gets approval for an investigative committee. The trail leads them to General Smedley Butler. I appeared before the Congressional Committee, the highest representation of the American people under subpoena to tell what I knew of activity, which I believe might lead to an attempt to set up a fascist dictatorship. The plan as outlined to me was to form an organization of veterans, to use as a bluff or as a club at least, to intimidate the government and break down our democratic institutions. The investigative committee ultimately finds evidence of a plot, but does not call for the testimony of the conspirators, and the investigation dies. The business elite soon realized a coup was no longer necessary. If they could somehow divide the working class opposition, crippling the parliamentary process. After the end of World War II, large sects of the economic and political elite successfully shift focus to an all-powerful big government. In other words, pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. Uh, what has been created by this half century of massive corporate propaganda is what's called anti-politics. So anything that goes wrong, you blame the government. Well, okay, there's plenty to blame the government about. But the government is the one institution in which that people can change. It's the one institution you can affect by participation without institutional change, right? That's exactly why all the anger and fear is directed against the government. The government has a defect. It's potentially democratic. Corporations have no defect. They're pure tyrannies. So therefore you want to keep corporations invisible and focus all anger on the government. In 1946, what is generally regarded as the first free market libertarian think tank emerges in the United States, called the Foundation for Economic Education. FEE sought to sell free market capitalism as an entirely new product to those who lost faith in the capitalist system after the Great Depression. It was founded by an American economist influenced by the Austrian School of Economics named Henry Hazlitt, Leonard Reed from the Chamber of Commerce, and John Birch Society founder Robert Kolch. Within its first four years, FEE was funded by executives from corporate giants like Standard Oil, Monsanto, General Electric, DuPont, Ford, Merrill Lynch, and many more. Sitting on the board of FEE was J. Reuben Clark, 
a devoted anti-Semite who owned multiple copies of the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, a fabricated text purporting to describe a Jewish plan for global domination. FEE ally Henry Ford funded printing of 500,000 copies of the Protocols that were distributed throughout the United States in the 1920s. FEE also published works by Holocaust deniers and Christian Reconstructionists R.J. Rushdumi and his son Gary North. What happens to the economy? Would it return to the gold standard? Yes, it would. Because? Because uh, God uh, stipulates uh, money by measure. Uh, just weights and just measures shall you have. So adultery was considered a theft of the family. It was, yes, it was treason to the family. Homosexuality? Yes, it was treason to the family. Worthy of the death sentence? What? Worthy of the death sentence. Uh, deserving yes. of the death sentence. Yes, that's what Paul says. I'm not saying that everything in the Bible I like. Some of it rubs me the wrong way. But I'm simply saying this is what God requires. This is what God says is justice. Therefore, I don't feel I have a choice. R.J. Rushdumi's son, Gary North, is the director of development for the Ron Paul curriculum, a series of homeschooling videos that teach Austrian economic theories and historical revisionism. But uh, sort of along the line of uh, the pills uh, creating the immorality, I don't see it that way. I think the immorality creates the problem of wanting to use the pills. I think the immorality creates the problem of wanting to use the pills. Sex creates the problem of wanting to use the pills. Ron Paul just equated sex with immorality. When 83% of the population think the economic system's inherently unfair, that's supposed to mean they're angry at the government. Uh, if you can take that view, then uh, those uh, who run the private institutions are quite well off. Uh, there's no threat of democracy. Uh, they can run things peacefully. Uh, the people are demoralized. The normal weapon, the normal methods of democratic participation uh, to gain social ends are excluded. So it makes good sense for corporate propaganda, which means most of what we see and hear, makes a good sense for it to be trying to stress the message that the government is the enemy uh, and, the, and to de-stress, in fact, eliminate from sight the fact that private power exists. So if government is the enemy, everybody else is in harmony. Uh, you can't do anything through the political system because it's your enemy. So therefore, let us, we and run the private system, let us run everything and don't bother us. The John Birch Society was founded in Indianapolis on December 9, 1958. It was chartered under the general laws of Massachusetts as a non-profit educational organization. National disarmament is a condition for effective UN control. Even so-called conservative Republican administrations have been committed to building this new world order. We have before us the opportunity to forge for ourselves and for future generations a new world order. A world where the rule of law, not the law of the jungle, governs the conduct of nations. John Birch Society presents the United Nations, a look into the future. I believe those individuals in this country, and there are plenty, who believe that we should have the right to own and bear arms, ought to be concerned with what's happening in the United Nations, because they are a threat to us. They would confiscate our guns. There have been proposals made at some of their conventions where they would literally repeal the Second Amendment. IRS agents use wiretaps, mail openings, informants, disguises, guns, chains, and jails to get every last dime. According to the John Birch Society at the time, Ike was, quote, a dedicated, conscious agent of the communist conspiracy. 
The John Birch Society also contended that fluoride being added to drinking water was a communist mind control plot. And they contended that the secret conspiracy to destroy America encompassed everything from that darn fluoride to the League of Women Voters and the Civil Rights Act. The John Birch Society was in fact so opposed to civil rights that they responded to the Supreme Court's Brown v. Board of Education decision to desegregate schools with billboards calling for the impeachment of the Supreme Court's chief justice. Nobody can stop them. They're having their way with America. They want our guns. And if you're not with them, cops and military, ah, then you will declare that you're with the Republic now. And don't tell me that I'm a weirdo because I'm upset about this and I should only go get upset about my favorite football team winning or losing. Listen, I know what tyranny means. I know the bankers are putting poison in our food and water. I know the bankers have stolen $8.5 trillion. I know we're under War Powers Act. I know they're hurting us. I know they're carrying out New World Order. I know they staged those terror attacks. You know what it's like to gut up to this and go out every day and go past the peer pressure and come out day one and say, 9-11 was an inside job and lose most of the radio stations I was on. You know what it's like to go to sleep every night knowing you work for a bunch of psychotic killers and you bastards are probably going to end up killing me one day? You know what it's like knowing you've ruined my life? You know what it's like, you sons of bitches? Anti-politics is a very scary phenomenon. It can take the form of uh, that it is taking. You know, forming what shouldn't be called militias because remember, militias are things raised by states. These are just private armies forming private armies uh, to defend the country, the people against, uh, you know, the UN forces being brought in and the black helicopters by the Council on Foreign Relations to commit genocide or whatever story you like. Or else it's, uh, you know, fight against Lucifer and Beast 66 who's doing this, that and the other thing. And uh, that's what, if you take a look across the country, that's what people are worried about and fighting against. Uh, aliens, uh, you know, the devil, uh, the UN forces, uh, the Federal Reserve, I mean, everything except what's real, namely private, corp private tyranny, private corporate power, the guys who are listed in the Fortune 500. Well, that's an achievement. That's a propaganda achievement. And while the anger and the fear is real and it's based on something and you got to sympathize with it because it is real, uh, when your wages have dropped 25 percent roughly in say 15 years and you know your wife has to work and your kids can't eat and so on and so forth and you have no future and everything's rotten you have a lot to be angry about but people are not focused on what's doing that's the difference between the days in which there was a live functioning labor movement that was organizing these people exactly these people to work together to change things undoubtedly the liberty-based libertarian free market von Mies Ron Paul movement of the last 30 years that was such a tiny voice 30 something years ago is now huge. One of the first men to describe themselves as a libertarian in the United States was journalist H.L. Mencken, a white supremacist and anti-Semite who was part of the original America First movement, opposing the United States entering World War II. Mencken believed Darwin's theories of survival of the fittest should apply to society and that the superior man should rule over what he saw as the inferior masses. This made him hostile towards all forms of democracy. Ayn Rand addressed Mencken in correspondence as the greatest representative of a philosophy to which she wanted to dedicate her life, individualism, and later described him as her favorite columnist. The newest proposals of having special millions spent on subnormal children is the attempt to bring everybody to the level of the handicapped. The Mises Institute was established in 1982 by Lou Rockwell, Burton Blumert, and Murray Rothbard. Almost immediately after its creation, the Mises Institute, whose headquarters reside in Auburn, Alabama, began publishing criticism of compulsory integration, attacks on Abraham Lincoln, and neo-Confederate propaganda. Institute scholars have also spoken to racist groups such as League of the South. Murray Rothbard, a student of Ludwig von Mises, made it his goal to fuse capitalism with libertarianism in the United States and is considered the founder of anarcho-capitalist philosophy. 
the United States is a uh, is sort of out of the world on this topic. Mm -hmm. uh, Britain is to a limited extent, but the United States is like on Mars. So here, the term libertarian means the opposite of what it always meant in history. Uh, libertarian throughout modern European history meant socialist and anarchist. In 1992, Rothbard bashed the Republican establishment, the Democratic Party, and the mainstream media for what he referred to as a campaign of fear and hate against former KKK grin wizard and failed U.S. Senate candidate David Duke. Rothbard blamed Duke's loss on the black vote in his 1992 essay, Right Wing Populism. Similar sentiments were echoed in Ron Paul's infamous newsletters published between 1988 and 1996, when Ron Paul had briefly retired from politics. In a copy obtained by CNN of the Ron Paul Political Report, one of several newsletters published in his name during the 1980s and 90s, quote, order was only restored in L.A. when it came time for the blacks to pick up their welfare checks. Another excerpt. The criminals who terrorize our cities in riots and on every non-riot day are not exclusively young black males, but they largely are. As children, they are trained to hate whites, to believe that white oppression is responsible for all black ills, to fight the power, to steal and loot as much money from the white enemy as possible. Ron Paul's former chief of staff, Lou Rockwell, who was also a founder and chairman of the Mises Institute, was the editor of the newsletters. The racist and homophobic content didn't come as a surprise to those who closely followed the careers of Lou Rockwell and Ron Paul. In 1990, Lou Rockwell made the case for bringing racialized politics and culture wars to the forefront of the libertarian movement. He called this new movement paleo-libertarianism. Though Ron Paul now denies writing the newsletters, he admitted to writing them in 1996, insisting that there is nothing racist about the newsletters he had published for almost a decade. The newsletters became a national controversy in 2008 and 2012 when Ron Paul ran for president sending the right libertarian movement into full panic mode. In February 2012, the hacker group Anonymous hacked into the emails of a white supremacist political party called American Third Position and discovered direct ties to Ron Paul. What I can tell you right now is that after having been in the libertarian movement for uh, for a decade, I have seen the, this type of racialized rhetoric, and I have seen it up close. But what I stated yesterday on my Facebook page, and one of the, some of the statement that I really want to stick by here, is the uh, the weird brand of ethno nationalist mumbo jumbo from Trump did in part come from the libertarian movement. But you know what? That's why we true libertarians are so glad that Trump is the nominee. Why? Because now all the Nazis, the crazies, and the other turds have left our movement. I mean, congratulations, Republicans. Thanks for helping the libertarians clean house. You know, at the very least, Trump has exposed jo Alex Jones as the fascist child that I have been telling people that he was for years. He's a, a mountebank and a fraud and a snake oil salesman. And it's, isn't it amazing, too, that the people who have been terrorizing us for the last decade about government putting us all in FEMA camps, remember that? They've now embraced the ideology of people who, are, who actually put people in camps. A snake knows only how to do one thing, and that is to fight and that is to kill. So the snakes that we're facing, we need to stop thinking that we can negotiate with. I myself was involved in the Ron Paul campaign back in 2012. So when I walk up and I'm like, hi, I'm a fascist, they're like, oh, like Donald Trump. I'm like, not exactly, but close. Hail Trump! Hail our people! Hail victory! path to a free society requires child-friendly parents, and if there are pouring into America hundreds and hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of child-unfriendly or child-hostile cultures, then if Donald Trump can put a stop to that, that buys some time to convince people closer to the child-friendly paradigm to, to change their behavior so that a more peaceful society can come about.
When the majority of voters say this is how we want our city to be, why would you not want to respect that democracy? Well, it's probably one of the best arguments against democracy. You know, Karl Marx said that democracy leads to socialism, and socialism is slavery. Monarchies are relatively superior over uh, democracy, traditional monarchies. brand of what's called anarchism in the United States and to an extent in England. Yeah. If you take a look at it, it's advocacy of the most extreme form of autocracy and oppression that has ever existed. The policies very quickly turn into concentration of power in the hands of unaccountable private institutions. If you have private ownership of the means of production internally, it's essentially a totalitarian institution, almost necessarily. There's a group at the top, maybe a person or a group, they make the decisions, they give orders, people down the hierarchy get the orders, transmit them. At the very bottom, uh, you get people who are permitted to rent themselves to survive, that's called a job, a wage labor, and you get the outside community who's allowed to purchase what you produce, and of course they're very heavily propagandized to make them uh, want to consume it even if they don't. So that's the nature of the system. It's kind of about as close to totalitarianism as you can imagine. Hitler was obsessed with the idea of the survival of the fittest, and Goebbels' propaganda films reflected this obsession. Hitler believed human beings were simply animals, and that the strongest animal would always win. If his subordinates were strong enough, then they would succeed without his help. But, Herr Professor, es brechen sich doch nicht alle gegenseitig auf. Wenn auch das nicht gerade, aber sie leben alle in einem ständigen Kampf. He needs intensive care for six months. Who pays? That's what freedom is all about, taking your own risk. This whole idea that you have to prepare and take care of everybody. That is what, uh, in fact, makes man a sacrificial animal. That man must work for others, concern himself with others or be responsible for them. American libertarianism is perfectly happy to support masters. In fact, it uh, extols them. It's in favor of it. It wants no interference with the uh, domination and control of uh, people in the workforce, let's say. That's very counter to uh, traditional libertarianism, either in Europe or for that matter in the United States.